Hi there. I am so excited today. Our guest has been called one of the 50 most must follow women entrepreneurs a couple of years ago by the Huffington Post. And I know it's still true today. I, I met our guest randomly over maybe the last half a dozen years at different business events. And we showed up in the same place. And then we, we met again this year at, at another more intensive business mastermind event. And I just had to have her on the show because I wanted her to share her insight and wisdom with you. So I hope you got a notepad ready because this is going to be one incredible dynamite show. Our guest, Beate Chalette, wrote the women's code. The women's code, and I gotta read this, I got pages of this stuff, but I'm not gonna read it all. But she advocates balanced leadership principles to improve the bottom line and help women lead and manage whether it's a small team or corporation. Now, if you're not a woman, don't worry because she works with men too. And it's just like, she's just like one incredible woman. She's also the number one award-winning author of the book, Happy Women, Happy World. Now, all of us men know what that means. So uh, we, we've, always, we've always got to keep our girlfriends or our spouses um, happy, and it leads to a much happier life. Now, we're going to talk about this later, but at one point, Beate was $135,000 in debt. So for those of you that know what that like, and many of you may have been in more debt than that, she went from $135,000 in debt to selling one of her companies to a little guy named Bill Gates for multi-million dollars. So we're going to talk to her a little bit about that story. Um, the other thing I wanted to say, I didn't even say this. My name is Michael Harris. I'm a host of Falling Up Radio. Right there, Falling Down, Getting Up. If you want to get a copy of of the book there's a uh, let's see right up there falling down getting up you can go to the falling uh, up radio website and just download a free copy so whether you're listening to this on the website youtube apple doesn't matter just go to the website falling up radio and download that and i'll mention this again at the end because all of Beate's information is going to be on the website too she's she has it she'll have her own page there too so Beate Chalette, I'm so happy you're here today. I couldn't tell you how how much I was looking forward to this, Michael. I think we're going to have a ton to talk about. So thank you for having me. Yeah, ab absolutely. And, and I got to be honest with you. It, um, I don't remember what, one of the business events that, that we were at a couple of years ago. Um, I was a little intimidated by you because it's just like I met you and, and I thought, wow, man, this woman is really dynamite. She's really strong. She's got all this business knowledge. And it's just, I could feel the energy around you. And it's just like, I kind of was, like I said, a little intimidated about it. So is that common? Do other people get that? I get this, unfortunately, or fortunately, a lot, you know, <laughs> so, so even my own daughter says uh, that I am pretty intimidating. So to me, you know, obviously, I, I don't know anything about that. I can only just go by what other people are, are picking up on. But what I will say is I think that sort of the secret to the showing up strong is that I'm pretty unapologetic about who I am. And, you know, I own my mistakes, mm -hmm. and which is why I love your show and your podcast about, you know, falling and then getting up because I truly believe that, we're not, uh, we're not judged by how bad we fall. We are judged by on whether or not we get back up. Yeah. And that is, you know, and when you do that enough times, I think the first time your heart gets broken, you are devastated. The 15th time you go like, you know what that feels like. It's going to take about X amount of time. You know, I'm going to heal. I'm going to survive. Whereas the first time you just think that the world ends and you, you somehow die of a broken heart because you're never going to love again. That was yeah. it. It's all over. Yeah. Exactly. So I think that uh, because I've been through so much adversity and hardship and really tough, big stuff, not little things, but big stuff, which I'm sure a lot of your listeners have, and I know your story, and I know you've been through hell and back, you know, uh, to, to recover from what you're recovering from. And 
you know, that just builds at one point this resilience and this confidence that you say, well, none of that stuff killed me. And I was able to keep getting back up and getting back up, getting back up. And then I found my groove. I made it through the darkness. I came out on the other side. And then, you know, as you have said, you know, and when my ship came in, it wasn't some little dinghy. It was a luxury cruise liner. Absolutely. You know, that's, that's really in essence the, the confidence, but I, you know, behind the scenes, I'm very conscious about it. So I make sure I smile a lot. Mm -hmm. I make sure that I, you know, my appearance is, accordingly a little softer than what I come across. So when I, you know, speak, I wear skirts and heels and, you know, I really work on that branding component because you need to be aware of how you come across, but yes, and yes, and yes. Sure. Now I, I, I want to get in a little bit more, um, some of the challenges you had, but before we do that, I want to ask you, a little bit more about what you're doing today. I, I know you're, you're, you've done a lot of coaching, you, you've done a lot of keynote speaking. Um, so to tell the, the listener what it is that you are really doing today and what's your main focus and intention today? Thank you. So my objective today is to be in the training and development business. So there's two areas I focus on. One is entrepreneurship and what it comes with, you know, sales and uh, creative thinking, innovation and staying the course, resilience mindset. And the other part is because I've been, you know, I'm a woman in business is to really help companies to balance, you know, men and women at work on whether that's a small team, a large team, or I've done uh, a pretty significant size uh, project that I'm working on with the entire oil and gas company uh, industry, actually, that want to change their image to be more women inclusive. So anything that has to do with really figuring out how to stay in balance in my soft spot clearly is wherever women are, just because I know that the double duty of being a mom, having children and uh, working is is very, very difficult, uh, especially with the epidemic of single moms and the you know stuff that single moms are up against. So, you know, to sum it up, so I'm the growth architect, founder of the Women's Code, and the two areas I'm interested in is balanced leadership and entrepreneurship, and they kind of seem to always go back hand in hand together. Sure. sure. And I, when, when we talked um, a few months ago um, at, at our Mastermind event, I, I heard you talk more about the work that you're doing with the oil and gas industry and how that's unfolding, and I was really quite intrigued, I guess is the right word, intrigued by the passion that you have for that work and really bringing out the best in women in these large organizations. Yeah, so there's really two parts about it, Michael. So number one, it is, um, you know, in the women's code, I've developed, you know, I love structures, processes, you know, architecture of things, blueprints, repeatable processes, modules, phases, elements. I mean, I, I, I have really a thing for structured repeatable processes because I believe structure provides freedom. Mm -hmm. And um, I came up with this uh, concept of the women's code where I recognize that the first step to women's advancement or to equality or to diversity of thought, you know, which is really the outcome we're trying to achieve is diversity of thought. It's, an, it's not so much about unfairly promoting women. It's about uh, and it's not about unfairly giving minority opportunities that they shouldn't be having. It is about saying that the that the internal should represent what America looks like. And in order to achieve that, when you have, you know, the balance is off, then you have to take something away or add something to start the scales to move. So that's that's my objective. So the first step is that women support other women, which when I wrote my book, you know, my first book, uh, The Women's Code, Happy Woman, Happy World, really wasn't even a big thing yet. And now suddenly in the last, what, two years, there have been thousands of women's organizations founded all over the world. Nobody talks about anything other but women supporting other women. And that's now a thing, which I predicted. Because the bigger issue is that we have these established patriarchal systems that have been built by men for men, and they work great for men. And there's nothing wrong with it, but the requirements have changed. Yeah. So now we need to expand these systems. So yes, my passion is, is 
is like a burning inferno when it comes to, but wait, wait, I have the solution. I have the solution. We don't have to be in another gender war. You know, we, 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 we there's an there's a easy way to do this. There's an easy way to explain it. So I work with a lot of men because men, men want to be supportive, but they don't want to violate the men's code. Yeah. So, so how, how do you support women and minorities without upsetting the brotherhood? Yeah. You know, and men are very challenged with that. Oh, and it's quite prevalent right now in our, mm -hmm. in our world, in our society. And um, again, that, that's a whole rabbit hole all day long podcast. <laughs> I know. We, we, we could get in. So uh, maybe we'll leave that a, a little bit alone for now. Um, I want to know a little bit more too on how you got started because I know at one point you took an, an aptitude test and there's a few questions on, on the test and this is on, on the website. Are, are you afraid of heights? Uh, do you enjoy being outside and do you mind carrying things? And I thought, well, those are great questions. And then of, of course what came out of that was that based on this, you should be a roofer. So tell me, did you ever get into the roofing business? You know, I mean, it was tempting, but no. Uh, I, oh. you know, I think that when, when, when this test came back with you should be a roofer, and at the time I was like 16 or 17 years old, and my, my jaw literally like dropped down to my chest, and I'm like, you're kidding. Like, you're kidding me. And so, so the... The idea is that I think, and this is sort of, you know, to what you're trying or to not what you're trying, but what you're doing with this podcast is to, to, to get the point across that some of these things have their purpose and validity and they're right, but their conclusion is wrong. Yeah. So, you know, and, and, and the second part of the story is that was then this moment when I had decided to become a photographer which they tried to talk me out of it badly. Your, your, your parents or, or who was it? The, 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 the career counselor, oh, you know, the they, they kept saying, oh my God, these creative things. Yeah. Yeah. There's lots of applicants, but there's no jobs and no money to be made. Don't, don't even go there. Yeah. So I became a photographer anyway. And so there's this day when I'm working as a photography assistant, which is how you get started. I'm, I'm on a glacier in Switzerland and it was my job to hire the helicopter to take the Audi Quattro in this big net that was, you know, flown with this helicopter <laughs> on this glacier in Switzerland. And I'm standing there and I remember this moment and I'm going like, I am schlepping all right. Yeah. And I'm certainly at a certain height that other people wouldn't want to go to. And I am absolutely for certain outside, but I'm definitely not a roofer. So the <laughs> test was right. The yeah. conclusion was wrong. Listen, so you were on the roof of the world, so to speak. Exactly. Doing this, but the recommendation, a uh, little off. Right. And so, you know, so, so to, the, to your concept or to your idea, how do you get back up, you know, when you fall? I think that sometimes we get so caught up in these judgments of, I can't believe you're saying this to me. I can't believe you're doing this to me. I can't believe this is happening to me instead of listening to how is this going to unfold, you know, and to this day I've, I've, you know, I mean, even now when I, when I speak or I travel and I train, I'm always in a plane. I'm always up there. I'm definitely still schlepping stuff. Yeah. And, you know, and, and I, 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 I do spend a fair amount of my time outside. Yeah. So, you know, so, so there are certain themes that keep coming along. Just let's not always judge that the outcome that we presented with is the ultimate outcome that yeah. we just accept. Yeah. Now you, you did though continue to be, you became a photographer and a fairly successful photographer. Yes. Well, not so much in the photography. I think that what I realized is while I love the creativity and the creative people that I was better at the business side. So that became very early on, very clear that in my head, it immediately volunteers, you know, how these things connect and what needs to be done. You know, what are the steps? How does it need to be rolled out? How does it need to be launched? So I became a photo editor at Elle magazine in Germany 
And then once I left from Germany to the United States, I started a photography representation firm. And we worked with um, a lot of companies, American companies, and you know, my photographers uh, shot for Macy's and for uh, Ocean Pacific. We did a lot of swimwear, a lot of active wear. And I was a producer, still photography producer. So people flew from all over the world to Los Angeles to produce their photo shoots here when it was too cold in Europe. And, you know, I worked for Mercedes-Benz and BMW and Homeboy and Levi's, Wrangler, you know, a lot of very, very cool companies from Germany until wow. I eventually founded my stock photography business. So, so is that what you ended up selling to Bill Gates or Microsoft? Uh, to Bill Gates himself, who had a privately owned company called Corbis. And I, my company was called Beata Works, uh, stock syndication, stock photography syndication, specialized in architecture, interior, and celebrity homes. Wow. And yeah, so that was my, that was my hook. You know, I licensed the celebrity stories into 97 countries all over the world. I was the number one worldwide leader. You know, and this is sort of, you know, how the story then, you know, eventually turned is, um, you know, I, I did become the worldwide leader after I figured it out, after I cracked the code. And yeah. then they came and said, if I was willing to share with them on how I did that. And I said, absolutely not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, you want it, buy it. And they said, okay. And so they made me an offer to good to refuse. Yeah. Wow. So, but prior to that, you, you were in debt when you started out your company? Yeah, so what happened is that, uh, you know, and let's just say my fall was a, a 10 year fall. I mean, it just kept getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse, which I know you can totally relate to. And I'm yeah, sure absolutely. a lot of your listeners are here because they're going like, is this ever going to end? Yeah. Um, so mine was 10 years. And I, it started with, um, you know, having run my company and having this like weird feeling in my pit. You know, and I'm going like, ah, yeah, something's going wrong. And I, I let my key employee go, the only employee I had at the time. And it turns out that she had come up with a plan to run my business, which was to, to run her own business, my business just without me. And so she had gone to a key vendor or the key vendor approached her. We were not so sure how that all came together. And suddenly invoices that I billed were paid to them and then when I call, I'm like, hey, what's going on here? And they say, well, you know, you, you know, it was like, it was an absolute mess. So I sued them mm -hmm. because, <laughs> Michael, Germans have to be right. Oh. So um, I, I, you know, got deep into dead with this lawsuit because, you know, they just destroyed my business, the representation component of my business by, you know, by sort of taking that away from me. And I'm in this big, big fight. And, um, you know, and I learned that when an attorney wants a $20,000 retainer, mm -hmm. that gets them through one letter. Yeah. The first one. Yeah. And then there's a letter from the other attorney, and then your attorney needs to respond to that letter. And so you're just paying 5,000, 10,000, 10,000, 20,000, and it just goes and goes and goes and goes. Um, which I wasn't aware of, you know, and, and, and I didn't think about this. And so as I think that I'm just about to recover from this because I have production season coming up. So production season was always in the fall. So, you know, it, it would start around September when it gets cold somewhere else and then people would come here. September 11th comes and it wipes out my production business in 24 hours. I had a half a million dollars of work on the books and every single job canceled. There was not one person in the world in their own right mind, Michael, that wanted to go on a plane and fly to Los Angeles to produce a shoot. So that was, um, that was tough. And then I, the lawsuit settled about a year later and I, you know, and all the settlement money that I got paid for the attorney and my debt. Yep. And Still had nothing. Still had nothing. I still had nothing. I could have saved myself this year, you know, and I would have had nothing. I would have been a year ahead probably. And so I started to build up the stock photography syndication. And uh, because of my background as a photo editor as a, at Elle magazine, where we used to buy these stories, 
where, um, you know, my background in photography, you know, I knew all the top photographers. I went after the A-list. Mm -hmm. And with my background, people knew that I knew what I was talking about. And this was at a moment where digital photography hadn't really kind of come through yet. And especially in architecture and interior photography, when you have these large plate cameras, which is a technical issue because otherwise the lines are collapsing, you know, so, so, so the technology just wasn't there. So I flew all over the United States and pulled out boxes of these, of these, you know, slides out of these photographers offices and brought them here and, and scanned them and then put them in my database. But remember I had no money. So over time, you know, I got deeper and deeper and deeper into debt, but I had to build a CRM, you know, back then there was no off the shelf solution of CRMs. You had to build it. Yeah. Um, and, you, you know, and you needed people that were scanning. I wasn't the, you know, technology, you know, why? So, so, you know, it got very, very expensive pretty quickly. And so I'm now over a hundred and something thousand dollars in debt. And I fly to Europe, um, to see my father and my dad has a stroke and my father didn't have a stroke. My father had pancreatic cancer. Mm -hmm. And so within six weeks, my father dies. I fly back and forth and I'm thinking, uh, this isn't, how am I going to pay for this funeral? You know, because I'm so deep in debt. And so I remember then, and you think, okay, that's already pretty bad. She got no money. She's been lied. She's been cheating. You, you know, September 11th wiped out her business. Uh, now her dad's dead. My biggest fan, my biggest supporter, you know, we are in Germany at this beautiful Baroque church in Nether Bavaria and it's snowing. We literally just buried my dad. My phone rings. It's my office in Los Angeles. We're losing the house, hmm. you know, and I didn't own the house, but I had, you know, I lived in the house, I worked in the house. And so now we've been served a notice by the new uh, slumlord um, who deserves every ounce of karma when it comes back to him. <laughs> you know, that's it, right? It's yeah. over. Yeah. It's, 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 it's over. So I come back and I go, okay, you know, this is the moment. And I don't know if you had this moment, but I bet you did, Michael. This is the moment where you go, I've done it. I've done what I could. I've been I've there. Done what I Absolutely been there. Yeah. I, 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 I crossed every T. I, I did the trips. I put myself as far as I possibly could. I have to now find money. Bor I have to borrow money to pay interest on borrowed money, yeah. which is a really great financial model. Mm. Uh, and, um, and then you just say, it's not up to me anymore. I've done it all. I get a letter from the White House. Because I wrote a letter to the White House and I then George W. Bush, Michael, and I said to him in my total desperate letter that I only wrote because my former mother-in-law just would not shut up about it. And I said, if you know, you always talk about the small business being the backbone of the American economy, but look what happened to me. I've done the right thing. I'm a single mom. You know, I'm a single mom. I'm all as I'm going through a divorce and all of this with an alcoholic and a pathological liar through all of this. You know, I'm, 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 I'm living in a place that is going into foreclosure by a friend who is letting this place go into foreclosure. So I don't have to pay so much rent, you know, until the foreclosure notice comes to the door. So these are all my stories and you know, it just keeps going and going and going and going. And the letter from the white house says, dear Mrs. Shillette, the president is delighted to hear from you. And it puts me in touch with the small business administration. Wow. So I had written a business plan in my spare time every night and every weekend. And when that phone call from the deputy chief director from the SBA came in, I walked into that office and I was prepared. Within three months, they restructured my debt. You know, uh, my, they, they, they restructured my, my plan. We were looking for a bank to underwrite, you know, the debt and restructure the debt. Um, we found a bank and they took the $135,000. They put it in a fixed 10-year uh, uh, loan. It freed up my line of credit, so I'm going more in debt. Three months later, I'm profitable. 18 months later, I'm the world leader. Wow. So something really, I mean, it was like that overnight success 10 years later. 
I always say I'm a 13 year overnight success. 13 yes. years, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, with, with all the trials and tribulation, but you're absolutely correct. This is what people often don't understand is the many things we do as entrepreneurs to test, is this working? Is this working? Is this not working? It's no different the second time around. Yeah. I and wish there wasn't. Yeah. So you just kept doing that and you kept doing that and you kept doing that. So wh where does the women's code come in? How does, how does this lead you into working more intensely with women or helping other women in their businesses? Tell us a little bit about that evolution. Yes. So now I have just sold my business to Bill Gates. I am, I just closed a multi-million dollar deal. I'm in the integration. I'm preparing my, you know, sales presentations. I'm telling them how to, you know, I'm mapping out for them, how they can recoup their investment, how they get a return on investment. I'm training the salespeople, you know, I'm going in, you know, typical Beata Chalet style mm -hmm. and a little intimidating, confident, you know, now I'm top in the world. And they said, we want to offer you a position as a senior director of global entertainment. We want you to run our entertainment division. Mm -hmm. And I said- or for the company you had just sold to Bill Gates. That was, my company was acquired in, into this Bill Gates company because they wanted to, they wanted to build out this entertainment division. And they, you know, had turnover just after I, I've been acquired. And then I went in and I took the position to run the whole division. And that's when I saw it, Michael. It was the guys are doing their bro thing. And, you know, the women, the, how they act with each other. There was a director. She's alluding to secrets that only she's privy of, which is total bullshit, you know. Uh, you know, to just hold on to her position and this, this climate of fear and not knowing. And I'm going, you guys are kidding me, right? This is a joke. Mm -hmm. And that's when I said, okay, I'm going to quit this. I'm going to found the women's code and I'm going to put my service into sharing what I did as a single mom, immigrant, um, mom, entrepreneur, you know, who, who, who did this, who really cracked the code because more women needed to know about this. And then as I did this, I realized that a lot of men said, well, you know, don't exclude us. And I've said, okay, okay, fine. You know? And uh, so I work with probably pretty evenly men and women. Um, it's just that, you know, my focus is on the balance portion of things. I, I, I do have great compassion for people who want to who understand that we had a critical moment in in time right now where there's such a you know a tectonic shift in the way we operate do business generation c people planet purpose you know profits isn't the only thing anymore i mean it's a major shift right now so whoever wants to be in that shift and and be more in balance in their leadership style or in their corporate culture or in their organization i'll work with so that's like now like the oil and gas industry, and that's even a larger scale versus say a small woman's own business. Absolutely. So I think that what I like about working with entrepreneurs directly still, it's, it's kind of like having the pulse, right? You, you, still, you still kind of feel what's going on. I think sometimes people that have been in a corporate job for what, 40 years, 30 years, 20 years, they don't really know what that's like, you know, what people, that don't have these benefits and they don't have the safety net and they don't understand the politics and they don't know how to, how to, how to be in this position, right? Because not everybody works at a job that they love and adore. So what do they do? So it keeps me grounded, mm -hmm. but I definitely am focusing on big things now, bigger things, because I think I can handle it. Yeah. And then how did, how did your book come about? My book came about because when you go in the speak it circuit, as you very well know, um, without a book, you can't even, you know, it's, it's a joke. You have to have a book that is a decent book, a good book that people actually want to read that, that makes good sense. And it helps you to organize your information and flushes out the message because writing a book is not innate to me. I'm a talker in case you haven't noticed. So the sitting and the writing and the story is not so much. Yeah. Yeah. 
But it, it's really, as I understand it, it's where you really put out the, the women's code. Is that right within your book and talk about yeah. how that applies to business and life? Yes, absolutely. Yes. So in the book, I came up with a couple of concepts that are very specific for how you get out of this overwhelm. So, you know, and I have it right here. So, so the subtitle of the book is the foolproof fix that takes you from overwhelm to awesome. Hold, hold that up again. Here you go. So again, if, you, if you're listening on an Apple, come to uh, the website. Exactly. And so I learned that most people are very, very overwhelmed, like 24 seven. And then I looked into why that is. And I saw that, especially in social media, what we tend to do, and in the book, I call it the triple paradox. So one of the paradoxes is that we believe we have to be the accumulation of the perfection of the 10 best friends we have. So we look at the friend that cooks like Martha Stewart. We cook at, uh, uh, that decorates like Martha Stewart. We look at the friend that cooks like Gordon Ramsay. We look at the friend that's running the triathlon. We're looking at the friend that has a smashing career. We look at the friend that has the sexiest wife or husband. We look at the one that does is the best mother or the father. And then we go, oh my God, I'm such a failure. I don't cook like Gordon Ramsay. I don't decorate like Martha Stewart. I, 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 I'm, I'm not as good as a mother as her. I definitely don't run a, tri a triathlon. I mean, I don't cook organic meals. I, you know, you like flip out. And so we are so driven by what we perceive as this perfectionism that I said, this got to end. So I came up with this concept called egorhythm, which is sort of my, my big core concept where you, you look at your life like a loaf of bread and you take it with a bread knife and you cut it into slices. So if you've ever been to Paris and you walked, you know, by a bakery and you have this smell of this fresh baguette, all you want to do is shove the whole thing in your mouth and eat it because it is so good, but that would not be practical. So yeah. you, you eat a little bit piece, a piece now, you have one for breakfast, one with garlic later, you know, maybe a sandwich for lunch and you, you have the whole thing. And then I thought, wait, what if our life was like that? We could have the whole thing we just would need to know what slice at what time. Mm -hmm. And so when you know what your, what egorhythm you're in naturally right now, and whether that's a transition, whether that's a tragedy, whether that's a family, whether that's love. So I've identified nine main egorhythms. And when you know which one you're in, which, you know, I have a whole bunch of tools and processes that come with the book, needless to say, yeah. <laughs> for you yeah. to figure it out. <clears throat> then you have the ability to say, okay, I'm in a transition egorhythm right now. So I am not worried about love. I'm not worried about health. I'm not worried about that. I mean, it's important. It's not my main focus. And so that's why this book has gotten such phenomenal reviews. It's won three awards because women that have read it and people that have read it, you know, I, I wrote it a perfect, specifically as a paperback book. The chapters are good for when you go to the bathroom. I mean, this is what I was thinking. So the woman who reads it can leave it in the bathroom so that the men can read it too. Mm, there you go. Yeah, happy women, happy world. That's exactly right, <laughs> even in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I know that you, you've gotten on, on stage quite a bit too and talked about these ideas. Uh, how are people re receiving it? What, what, what's your feedback when they go through this? Well, the feed, yeah, so the feedback is, um, so people, you know, when I speak about sort of the overwhelmed awesome when I talk to women and I, my focus when I speak is about giving people the verbiage the actual language to use that they can implement into, into how they are communicating what they're trying to get across, right? So if I'm a woman and I'm not being seen or heard, what do I have to teach her? What does she need to know so that she can get out of that and build her confidence so she can show up stronger and say, I need this, or 
here is what I am contributing, or here's why I should be getting this promotion, or here's why I need to be part of this opportunity, or here's why you need to work with me. This is why you should be my client. This is why I should, you should be hiring me. Hiring mm-hmm. me. So I give people the actual language. It's a really big part of what I do. So people that I speak to, they walk out. I think sometimes they don't know what exactly happened. <laughs> <laughs> but it, they feel empowered. And they're ready, you know, and everything I do is tangible. So they get handouts, they write things down. I said, use it, use it today. And so I, you know, and whether that's the woman that works at, uh, you know, the water company who then got the permanent promotion using the formula, or when I talk to men, I I did a presentation at a, a large company that's a learning management system here in Los Angeles. And the CTO says, well, we hire, you know, a lot of men and we don't know how to change that. And within one hour of my presentation, you know, they sitting there, you know, this is the CTO and the senior, senior leadership team when it comes to diversity and inclusion said, we've been trying to figure out how to articulate this for years. And you told us how to do this in an hour. Wow. wow. That's great. So as you're talking about this, one of the things that, that comes to uh, mind um, for the listeners, especially, is there, do you have a couple, two, three ideas that maybe a listener could take right now based on your, your women's code or something else that they may be able to use? I love that you're asking that, you know, so yes, of course. So the first thing that um, is, is another really big core message of mine, and I call this my tunnel analogy. So when you go to Europe and you Uh, go and drive through the mountains, which you inevitably will, if you go to the beautiful places. There is the sign on the tunnel that says this tunnel is 2,793 meters long. Then you go in the tunnel and about, what, 10 seconds in, you're freaking out because it's dark. You heard of the explosion. People have died. There was a fire, the tanker, you know, whatever. whatever. So your mind is volunteering 10,000 things that you really don't want it to volunteer. And you lose this sense of, am I halfway in? Is it, would I be turning around? Would I be going through? So, and then suddenly, boom, you go around the corner, there's the light, you're out. So mm-hmm. I think that adversity or hardship is very, very much like that. Mm-hmm. So if you do not go through this entire tunnel, you, and you turn around, you will never succeed through this. So you are in the tunnel, you have to hold on because that, that light could be just right around that next corner. Yeah. Because it said it on the tunnel, it's 2,793 meters long. Yeah. So you know it's coming. And so I believe truly in adversity and especially when you fall hard, you know, or people that struggle with with addiction and people that struggle with uh, self-esteem, confidence, eating disorders, uh, people who have an idea and you know just get beaten down. You have to, you can't give up before the miracle happened. That's number one. Well, okay, let me ask you something on that because something came to my mind as you were talking about that. And I think about when um, you were $135,000 in debt and then you, you later on sold this company to Bill Gates. So when you're in that tunnel, so to speak, like that type of tunnel, how do you know that you're going to be able to go 2,793 feet and there's going to be Bill Gates or somebody else there to buy your company? Because we don't necessarily know that. Are we missing a sign early on? Is it real windy? I mean, how do we know that we're in that tunnel, so to speak? You know, it would be really good if there was a sign at the front of the tunnel and that said Bill Gates at the end, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, so that would be great if that what happened, but I don't, but that unfortunately is not the, the, the path. The path is that, you know, and this goes to the second thing I want to share. I truly believe that a lot of the healers of this world came here crash course style. So when universe, spirit, God, whatever you believe in, put us here, they said, okay, this plan is in pretty bad shape right now. So I'm going to deploy a whole bunch of you, but buckle up, 
in order for you to know how bad it is, I'm going to have to pile it on you like so thick. Uh, don't worry. You know, you'll make it through, but it's going to be gnarly to go through. But I think that for healers, and I work with a lot of people like that, and I bet you do too, is that this is the activation. The activation is, oh my gosh, I can't believe this is happening to me. The world is so unfair. It is the, what the heck is happening here? And it's just like, is this ever going? It doesn't even make any sense that, you know, this is piling up. So if that is what somebody's going through, and you feel that you have that, you know, that fuerza, that strength inside, you might be part of us. You might be activated. That, that's might really be interesting because I really, I was just connecting with, you know, when I was a child, I died um, as a result of a water skiing accident. And I left my body, had an out-of-body experience. And I didn't want to go back to my body. And I remember reaching out to the spirits as I was going back. And I was, I was told by them that don't worry, everything's going to be okay. And I'm thinking about that now that that's kind of the end of the tunnel, you know? And it's just like when you were talking about the, the spirits and, you know, the people coming to planet Earth and, and all this kind of stuff, it's just like, wow, that makes total sense. I can relate to that, totally relate to that. So that's really the two things. It's like... Do you feel that you are part of this activation? Are you being deployed? Are you here to heal? You can't heal if you are life is a princess story. She woke up a princess, things were handed to her. You know, life was great. One day she met a prince and then one day they gave her the crown and she was the queen. That's not a story that gives hope. That's not a story that changes that the story that changes people or the motivation, the hope, the inspiration comes from overcoming adversity and hardship. Because then we get to live the story and say, I didn't know I was gonna make it. I didn't know I was gonna make it. I did not know I was gonna make it. But if, if, if I was gonna go down, at least I would have gone down in flames. It wasn't a match, it would have been a flaming inferno. At least it's worth it, you know what I mean? Uh, I'm not drowning in a bucket. At least I'm going to drown in the ocean. You know, make it worthwhile my time. But so, at the end, everything is going to be okay. Everything's going to be okay. We're going to get through that tunnel. We're going to get through the tunnel. Uh -huh. And that is what I want or ask your listeners to really hear us say, it's going to be okay. Yeah. That you got to do the work. Yeah. I love that. Did you get through two and did, did you have a third one? Let's see if I have a third. Well, these are kind of like my two, my two big ones. So, and so, the, so go over them again. Just briefly name them again. What one and two are you? You're, okay. So number one is the tunnel analogy. Okay. So if you're experiencing hardship, if you have been falling, you're stumbling in the dark in the tunnel somewhere. So that tunnel will end at some point. So stay, stay the course, you know, on, if you crawl, if you're limping, you know, it doesn't matter. You know, there is an end to every tunnel. Number two, it is the, the sense, the knowing inside to connect with, are you being activated? Are you being activated to participate in the healing of this planet? Do you have a greater purpose? And tap, tap into that. Yeah, that's, that's in, incredible stuff. And, um, and with that may again be another show. I've, I've picked out four or five other shows. Of, of <laughs> Are you taking like notes? <laughs> that we could we talk about, you know, to, today. Um, you, you know, again, I, I, I go back to when, when we first um, I don't know whether it was our first time we ran into each other or the second time where I, where I was feeling that intimidation, feeling with you. I don't have that, that anymore. Well, I was just going to ask, are you still intimidated? No, not, not, not at all. I, I think it happened. Some of that shifted a, l a little bit um, with, our, with the mastermind group that we were participating in earlier this year um, and our friend Gail and, and all of that and, and that community there. Um, 
And like I said, I was just really excited to have you on the show and realize that you had this incredible information to share. Thank and you. that you were doing this incredible work in, in the world. And again, we had talked about the oil and gas industry um, work that you were doing there, that you're doing there with, with women. And um, it's just really powerful stuff. And we need powerful stuff in, in the world today. We need powerful men. We need powerful women. We need powerful people. We need people willing to stand up and take that action. And even though we might be in that tunnel, you know, that tunnel of darkness, we know that there is light at the end of the tunnel and it's going to be okay as we keep doing our work. So that's a powerful message. It's, oh, I have my, I have a third one. I just okay, thought about it. Let's go there. Okay. Okay. So if you've ever seen the, the, um, the Harrison Ford movie uh, where he is in, uh, what's the, I can't think of the name where he's like uh, Indiana Jones. Mm -hmm. And so there's this one episode, uh, this one movie where he needs to go across from this big cliff to this other side and he can't see it. Mm -hmm. And so it's not until he picks up the dirt and he throws the dirt that he sees it's an optical illusion. Yeah. So the third, the third big takeaway today is you do not know what the second step is until you've taken the first. Yeah. I remember that and he threw that out and then he steps right on out and is able mm -hmm. to cross. And yeah. then suddenly the path is clear, but you've got to take that first step. Yes. So, yeah. so those would be probably my favorite pieces of wisdom that, I, that I, I share that I really know are true in my heart. Yeah. Well, that's great. And I know that you, you have more inside of you. And I also know that sometimes... It just takes it a few little ideas to really get triggered, to really plant some new seeds, to really be able to grow something out of those ideas. You are absolutely correct. I think that's what a lot of people struggle with as well, Michael, is uh, in, including myself and, and, and possibly even you, is that we have these ideas and then we we ponder and we massage and we move them and then they're not moving. And then we go like, what is wrong with this? And then it's not until we have a chance and encounter or somebody says something or makes an introduction or suddenly something pops up. So there is no ultimate one proven way. You know, I always say there's a million, there are a million ways to be successful. You only need to find one, your own. Yeah. You know? so the way the, the, the way other people get, get successful will never be your own path because they're not you. So the, the confidence, the, uh, being unapologetically you, that's really the part I believe that people need to tap into more. And instead of comparing ourselves, owning what we are, but that's a lifelong quest to, yeah. to own who we are. Yeah. Yeah. How, how can um, the listener get a hold of you? Again, if you're on Apple or Stitcher or one of the other platforms and you're hearing the, the audio, I know you can come to the website, uh, fallingupradio.com, look at uh, Beate's um, page and get all their info. But tell them how to do it and spell your website because they may not know how to spell of your Of course, name. absolutely. So I made this super easy. So I put out a whole engagement page and you find that on the women's code and it's plural so it's the women's code.com forward slash beatis hyphen free hyphen gifts so i have a, a bunch of things from a brand new a balance planning tool for those of you who are overwhelmed which i literally just recorded it's about to be posted uh, and updated to a, a training on how to find uh, your ideal clients, to a free chapter of the book, to uh, all kinds of other tools. I think I have like six or seven tools worth like over $8,000 on this page. So pick and choose what you want. I'll send you the link and then you can, uh, you can engage wherever it resonates with you. Great, great. And through your, your website, they can get a hold of you directly as well and um, find yes. out information and yes and i always say this because it inevitably happens sometimes i'm going to give you my personal email address and it is the initial b and the initial c at 
beatechalette.com and that spells B-E-A-T-E-C-H-E-L-E-T-T-E.com. If you send an email with your feedback question, I will personally answer it. Awesome. That sounds really good. Again, if you didn't get that written down, that will be uh, on the Falling Up Radio website as well on Beate's page. So um, um, you'll, you'll be able to get it there. Again, you know, I want to really thank you, Beate, for taking the time to be here. I know that you're a really busy person. I know that, that I learned a lot. And I'm sure that the, the listeners learned a, a lot, too. And just like you had mentioned er, earlier in our conversation, you know, this idea of, you know, going from really nothing to overcoming that to um, seeing the, the fruits of our labor, so to speak, um, is a powerful message and is a powerful story. And we need to tell that because sometimes it's easy that when we fall, so to speak, we get down into the muck and, you know, we're, it's like quicksand sometimes and you go down and up and down and up and sometimes eventually you give up. And part of the reason for this show is to let people know that there is a way out, that it's really never too late at, at one point to be able to make that decision to go forward, to really live your dreams and, and really get inspired to not only help yourself, but to help those around you, your family, your friends, and to help the world and really be a force, whether it's helping, you know, like Beate, help, helping um, organizations, large organizations, oil and gas industries, you know, integrate more women in, into their business. You know, it might be your own local florist shop, if, you know, whatever it might be, but to be able to serve in the way that works for you knowing that that um, intention and that action does bear fruit when we're willing to do that. So absolutely. I and, 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 you know, and to interrupt you um, is, is I think that that's why the work you're doing is so critical because a lot of the stuff is that I see out there right now is about the window dressing and the internet marketing and great, greater, greatest, the five things. The one thing you must have, you know, buy this and your life will be amazing. That's all bullshit. I do believe that the, that the road you are going and what you're offering is this, this, this hardcore, you know, hold nothing back, clear conversations about we didn't get there yeah. because it was handed to us. We fought. And I think that's the message that people need to hear. You have to fight for what is yours. Yeah. Well, it's like the, another analogy that, that I use sometimes is like if you have a garden in your backyard and you, you plant a seed, you don't check that seed every day and take it out and put it in and take it out to see whether it's, it's going to grow or not or why it hasn't grown yet. You tend the garden. You keep it watered. You, you keep it hoed. You, you keep it clean and, and all that to give that seed time to come up go through the ground, that seed grows in the dark, just like the tunnel. The seed grows in the dark before- oh, That's a title, right. the seed grows in the dark. That's yeah, a title for something, ground. yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, right. nature yes. teaches us so much. Yeah, you're absolutely, you're absolutely correct. The seed grows in the dark. I might use that actually. That might be my fourth thing. Hey, <laughs> yeah, well, whatever works, it's all okay, so. Okay. Um, again, thank you, Beate, for being here. It's been thank a wonderful you. conversation. Um, I look forward to getting to know you more and the, the work that you're doing in the world is really incredible. And um, for all the listeners, please go to Beate's website and uh, take a look. And it's the, the women's code. The women's code.com, uh, yes. Um, get more information and, and download her information as well. And Step up, take the action, put the hole in your hand and clean the garden and let the seed grow. So again, thank you, Beate. Hold on till we get to the other side. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. And again, this is Michael Falling Up Radio. And be sure to share this episode with all your friends. Post it on your Facebook, Twitter, wherever you, you might um, see your friends. But tell them about this episode and share it because it just might change somebody else's life too. So have a super day. Talk to you soon.